Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Amy Ervat, and I am a private sector specialist with IFC's uh, employability program, Vitae, and I will be moderating this session. Today, we have an important topic for you uh, that can help you stay connected to the job market and make better decisions about the programs you offer. And that is gathering data, gathering data about your graduates and how to use that data to make evidence-based decisions. Um, we know that most of you, our audience, monitor their graduates in some way, much of the time informally through you know, personal relationships um, and not always in a formal manner. Uh, and today we want to talk to you about the importance of formalizing and upgrading uh, this data collection, how to use it, how to, how to do it and how to use it uh, to improve the programs that you offer and ultimately to improve the employability of your students. Uh, we know that you, our audience, uh, this is what you care about the most, providing your students with the best preparation possible to go out in the world and be able to land a good job. Data is power. The more you know about where your students are going and how successful they are, the better position you are in as an institution. Uh, and today in this webinar, we will explore uh, how educators around the globe are gathering this data, the different sources of, sources of information they're using, how they are using this data, uh, especially in countries where reporting is not uh, mandatory and thus nas national comparisons are not always um, easy to do. So we have a great panel of speakers for you. I am delighted to introduce them. We have Kim Yaosi Elsener. She is the Senior Manager for Career Data and Research at Lightcast, an organization providing data-driven talent strategies about the changing labor market. She has over two decades of experience in higher education. Kim received her PhD in higher education administration from New York University. We have Germán Cosio Arredondo. He is the director of the Employability Skills Department at Santo Tomas University in Chile. Previously, he worked with the Chilean government to enhance employability as a competence in education. Germán received his master's degree from University College London. And uh, last but not least, we have our own Delila Sohinak, our in employment uh, specialist. She's also an international education specialist with 20 years of experience in international education and uh, student services with experience over 30 countries. Uh, Delila has held administrative leadership positions as director of several departments at Berkeley College, Fairleigh Dickinson University, Seneca College and York University. So welcome to our speakers and thank you for being here. I'd like to start with you, Delina. Let's start our discussion. Um, first of all, could you, I mean, obviously you might have um, some comment about the uh, responses there, given our clients around the world. And I'd also like you to tell us why you think it's important for an institution to trace its students' employment outcomes. Um, thanks, Amy. Ye yes, indeed, those, those poll results were surprising. Mm. Um, and they were surprising because when we look into um, a collection of employment outcome data that universities do in the emerging markets, it's a very different numbers, but we're also looking whether they're using best practices. So that, that, that second response on the uh, response rate comes into play. Um, why are they important? Well, um, they help us determine whether our programs are relevant and if the skills our students have uh, are rele relevant for the jobs that they have. Um, in some parts of the world, employment outcomes and graduate satisfaction are key performance indicators for the institution and they're mandatory to conduct tracer studies and mandatory. When they're not, when institutions don't collect the data, they tend to react to anecdotal evidence about where their alumni are and what they're doing. 
Um, and data certainly helps institutions make more confident decisions. It's, it's based on evidence. Um, it helps us understand what questions need further research. It, data doesn't tell us why something happens, but it certainly red flags what needs to be further investigated. It certainly also provides accountability um, to our students and their parents, the community at large. It tells them information about our programs and what they can expect. Right, right. And, and when you say about particular programs, like uh, you, you, you'll be able to zone in and understand where the employment outcomes are coming from. Is it you know business or is it engineering? Right. Correct. Correct. So if we're if we're seeing in the data that for whatever reason our engineers are not getting a job, mm -hmm. or over a period of three years that mm -hmm. employment rate is going down, we certainly want to go back to the program, find out what the problem problem is, and we find that out by the secondary studies and further research. Right, right. That in turn then helps make changes in the curriculum to affect those employment outcomes positively. Right, right, as we, as you were saying, like making evidence-based decisions there. And I understand there are different uh, tracer study models that exist uh, globally. Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us about those and, and what you think might be the, the benefit of both? Right. Um, so there is some consistency in um, parts of the world like UK, Australia, or Canada, where, as I said, um, governments make it a, a mandatory practice of, of sorts. Um, and so there's a long history in this. Then in what we see in EU, it's it's sporadic. It's not at the level of European Union. So the instrument may be different. The uh, reference weeks, the census weeks, different across the countries. Um, but they are, and, and they're not done, you know, on annual basis. For example, we see also in um, uh, some countries like uh, Jordan, for example, where they use system data. Uh, certainly the World Bank uses a lot of system data to look at employment outcomes. When we look at our clients, um, and uh, I'm talking about IFC clients, that's emerging markets, about 13% of our clients actually do a tracer study using best practices, meaning there is a calendar and, and it's a pretty consistent methodology. Mm -hmm. The... Um, the advantage of doing it system-wide when everybody who is doing it, the government is mandating it, is essentially that it allows institutions to compare their programs to a, a, a group of peer institutions and see whether their programs are more relevant or less relevant. Um, I should just mention that the system data is a data point and it's important. But it is limited in that it doesn't really give us um, information about students who may have left the country. Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't give us that graduate satisfaction feedback into our programs, those questions we embed in a trace system. Right, right. Okay, and that was really interesting. That most of, that the clients in the uh, uh, in our parts of the world, it was thirteen percent that do uh, tracer studies. Right, right. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, do it the way it's it's you know in a systematic way. Let's say. Okay. Um, on on that, uh, given these two systems, sometimes countries require that come uh, that uh, universities right. get information, and others do not. And let's take a look at the U.S. in this case. Kim, uh, could you tell us what the model is in the U.S.? Is it mandated to, given, to, to provide information on employment, as, these, as Delita just said, they differ globally? So in the U.S., it's not mandated. It is used through lots of different ways. I would say that primarily it's been what I would call market-driven. So students and prospective students and parents and alumni and funders ask for this information from campuses. And so they're highly motivated to have the information available. Um, also ranking systems, which are really important in the U.S. with their institutions, often ask for career outcome data. 
So institutions are inspired through the ranking system as well. There are brand new regulations out actually this morning that Mm -hmm. are asking campuses to produce this information. Um, It's by by the federal government from the Department of Education, but those are still pretty vague. So I'm really interested to see how that unfolds since it just came out today. But there's a lot of other forces I would say that are driving campuses to do this. And the other piece to this is there's this college scorecard that's put out by the federal government as well. And outcome data is included in that. It's not necessarily mandatory. And there's not a lot of uh, guidance as to um, how to collect this information in a consistent manner. So comparing data in the US is often very difficult because the data can look, take on many different forms depending on the campus. Mm. And and how timely that uh, on the day of our webinar, there's a new regulation. I know. Wonderful, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I know for tracer surveys, you in the U.S. don't refer to them as that, right? You use a different word, first destination surveys. Uh, Could you tell us a bit more about that, how they're administered, what kind of information you ask for? Yeah, first destination surveys is what we call them. And they're really looking at collecting data from graduates six months to a year after they graduate. So that first sort of first year, thus first destination. Typically, there is some standards, some guidelines, I actually would call them, that are put out by a national organization that most campuses follow. So the basic information they're collecting in these surveys is what a student is doing. Are they employed? Are they continuing their education? Are they taking a year off? Things like that. And then there's some follow-up questions depending on their response. So they want employer information, job title, salary, programs they're studying. So those, that's the basic information. Most campuses focus on that six month time period because once you get past that, it gets a little bit more difficult to collect the data. And many campuses are collecting the data before the student even graduates. So it happens sort of as part of the commencement culture in the US. Right. I would also say another piece to this is the survey itself, Mm -hmm. but what you see when you see graduate outcome data in the United States is what um, we call a knowledge rate. So Mm -hmm. we gather that information via a survey. And then for the people who did not respond to the survey, we use lots of secondary sources and Mm -hmm. other information that we pull in to create a knowledge rate. So you might see a knowledge rate in the US of that 70% range um, usually, but often the survey response rate is lower than that. Um, It can be anywhere from 20 to 50% that they're getting from the survey and then they add on additional sources. So when you see knowledge rate in the United States, that's what they're saying is they've added on other sources to the survey. Oh, okay, knowledge rate. And that would be, what are the other, so could you tell us a bit about these other sources of information that the knowledge, what the knowledge rate refers to besides the survey? Yeah, so some of that information is validated information and some of it is just um, the best secondary data they can find. So one of the easiest places for campuses to go to get validated information is the National Student Clearinghouse. And Mm -hmm. that is a database that all campuses have to submit enrollment data to every semester. So you can then look up your graduates and see if they're enrolled in another program or another institution after they graduate. So say they graduate with a bachelor's degree, you can see if they're now obtaining a master's degree from another institution. So a lot of campuses pull information from that National Student Clearinghouse. Campuses can also work to get access to things like labor data through labor departments at the state and federal level, um, IRS tax information. Those databases are a little bit harder to get to, but they're also validated information. So it's valuable because you know that it's correct information. Um, So some campuses will do the work to get access to those databases. And then lastly, they're going to sources that they can find that are easy to find, such as the internet. They're doing Mm -hmm. searches um, to look at secondary sources through um, what they can find on the internet, as well as institutional knowledge. So many faculty members, for example, might know that one of their advisees is going on to a graduate program and they know what they're doing and they can report that to the institution and then they'll use that data. Right. Okay. So loads of different sources, some of them easier than others, but the internet you say is is a a big one. And on that, would it be social media and LinkedIn? Is that a good source? 
to figure yeah, out. So many campuses start with just Google searching or pick your favorite search engine um, mm -hmm. and then start looking for people. And many times it leads back to social media, whether that's LinkedIn or another um, social media source. Um, but if it's public, then we tend to use it. Um, some campuses will go for um, doing a little bit more searching um, to find information that maybe not isn't doesn't just appear in a search, but they can find it. Um, so a lot of people will start with social media. There are services out there that do data scrapes. So you can mm -hmm. contract with a company to, um, you can submit your data and they will scrape many different sources, most many times social media, other times they have employment databases that they've been able to get access to. So there's services out there, like um, in the US, Rocket Reach is one that um, a lot of people use. Um, Lightcast has services. Um, Stepping Blocks is another one that's coming into the market. And so there are some um, different companies you can contract with to start getting that information as well. I've used Rocket Reach in the past and it produces some really great information, but it does take time because you have to then validate it and clean it up once you get it back. So it's usually not neat information. Anything that's coming from a data scrape takes some time to clean up. Yeah, and what I'm hearing, this is quite there's quite a lot of effort involved and 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 manpower slash technology involved to get this uh, information. So since there's going to be quite a lot of effort put in and resources, um, could you also now give some examples of the benefits? Like how have you used this data, or how have institutions that you've worked with used this data? So I see them using it at three levels. I would say baseline, what everyone wants the information for is what I would call marketing. So how do we talk about this with donors, with prospective students, with perfect, with parents of prospective students, being able to just say, this is what we can do. This is sort of the return on your investment for coming to this institution. So very baseline, they want that marketing. They want the, you know, the nice infographic they can create as part of their admissions or fundraising campaigns. And then I would say the next layer, once campuses get a really strong base, is they start thinking about how they create feedback loops with that data. So sometimes it's feedback loops to the academic programs to make changes to curriculum, to think about how they're structuring career in their academic programs. And sometimes it's what I call feedback loops to the students or to the advisors of the students. So there's some campuses who have some cool databases now where a student can actually go in and search a history major and see what graduates from that college do with that major. They can see employers, job titles, graduate school programs, so they can start envisioning what their choices are through those academic programs. And then the last thing I would say is strategy. So thinking about it larger than just that outcome of that first job and thinking about, okay, how do we combine that information with other things on our campus to help us inform the strategies we're using? So I'll see campuses start combining it with um, activities that the students are doing or academic experiences they're having to try to figure out where to put their resources, which experiences lead to better career outcomes, and then how to use um, that information to strategically plan and integrate it into what they're doing when they're trying to change and grow the institution. Mm. Okay, so this is going way beyond, yeah, did you get a job? It's going deeper into helping the programs and uh, improve so that the students can get a job. And, and on this uh, analysis, can, can you give some, an example of, of what, uh, if I understand correctly, that the students that are doing certain activities was linked to getting jobs? Could, could you give us some examples of that? Yeah, so I've done this at a lot of different campuses, and it depends on sort of what they're focused on. But the work I'm, we're doing right now is actually looking at what experiences students had that led to not just their first destination career outcome, but we actually look at alumni data five and 10 years out through our um, survey services. And so what we're finding is there's really six experiences that are helping students succeed once they graduate and then for five and 10 years after. And those experiences are things like internships and mm -hmm. understanding career opportunities and mm -hmm. knowing how to plan your career, not just get that first job, but actually plan for your career and networking skills. Um, and those are things that are actually really easily integrated into an academic curriculum. 
If you think about all the different ways that an academic program can help people understand what career opportunities are linked with what they're learning or help people when they're getting internships, think about them strategically, whether it's, whether it's a networking opportunity or whether it's exploring your career opportunities or whether it's helping you create a plan for your career. Those are all things that an internship can do for students. And so campuses are now thinking about, okay, so if students are, when they have these experiences, they are seeing better career outcomes when they graduate. So mm -hmm. how do we make sure that all students are getting these experiences? Mm -hmm. In the United States, many of these experiences are what I call opt-in. So students have to choose to do an internship. They mm -hmm. have to choose to go to the career center to help explore their career opportunities. And so what campuses are doing now is saying, how do we take out that opt-in option? How do we actually embed this into the student's life cycle on a campus? to then figure out how we make sure everyone has these experiences with the goal then that increases um, everyone's opportunities when they graduate. Right, that, that's amazing. And uh, one last question here, Melon, is um, what about of, uh, align, using this data to align your program or curricula with the job market? Can the data help with that? The data can help with that. I think in the US, um, academic programs might be a little bit slower to change. I think that's probably because the labor market's different in the US. Mm -hmm. But what they are using it for is thinking about how they then um, help their students get to that career piece. So in the US, it's often been higher education has often been thought of as an or proposition. So students either want intellectual development or career. And um, it's sort of been assumed that the students who are interested in learning tend to go to the humanities, the social sciences, and the students who are interested in career going towards these, the science and engineering programs, nursing, business, teaching, social work, things like that. But we're really what we're finding in our data is students want both. And that's a very different way of thinking about an academic curriculum from a faculty standpoint. Many faculty are really good at helping students get to graduate school because that's the career path they followed. So what this data is helping them do is better advise students, better help students understand these are the opportunities you can have, these are the possibilities. It's allowing faculty to connect with employers to understand the employment market more. And that all feeds back eventually into how they're shaping the curriculum. Right, right. Okay. This is, uh, yeah, could also probably show you how the graduates uh, are getting jobs with the less po popular faculties, exactly. like yeah, what we're exactly. talking about, yeah, less popular. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's cross continents and go to Latin America. Uh, Herman, I'd like to ask you um, about your experience and in, uh, in, in Chile. But first of all, I just want to check. Uh, I understand that there's no regulation in Chile either. That requires an institution to conduct tracer studies or any kind of survey um, to trace employment outcomes and report on them. Is that correct? Um, yes, Amy. Um, in some sense, um, it is not compulsory to survey mm -hmm. our graduates. However, okay. uh, the Chilean government through higher education regulators uh, requires to collect information about both our graduates and our employers. So higher education regulators strongly recommend mm -hmm. to trace data about employability. Uh, actually, higher education institution in Chile under the National Quality Assurance Process uh, get more credential if the institution get quality data for their work, work uh, included its analysis and the way that data support institutional quality assurance process. So, uh, it's not compulsory, but it's strongly recommended uh, for recommend. one side. Okay. Uh, and, and on it, that, so since it's not recommended, uh, and, and many, and what we know uh, that many education institutions from our data in emerging markets don't do this. So I'd like to ask you, why do you think it's important? Why do you as an institution do this? Why do you think it's important? Yes. Um, firstly, I would like to explain that in Santo Tomas University here in Chile, we have both a curricular employability model and extracurricular employability model. Um, so that means we have compulsory curriculum program that students have to take. At the same time, students are supported by optional courses, just, such as how to use professional networks in internet or how to create a CV, the classical courses. 
both curricular and extracurricular employability models try to develop employability skills in order to prepare our students to the world of work. So we know it is important and, and do it even though it is not compulsory. For one side, for the internal quality assurance process, I, I mean, uh, the institutional level, but for other side at national level, for the national accreditation process conducted by the government based in rankings between higher education institutions. Uh, we see that the labor market change faster than the higher education institutions. Mm -hmm. And we need to better understand this change so we can improve our programs and prepare our students for this change in the job market. Um, Without this advice and data, we are blind to this change in the labor market and we can satisfy the expectation of the employers on one side and expectation of our students as well. I mean, expectation related uh, basically to access quickly to the labor market after graduate and also expectation related to remain into the labor market when you get your first job. Right, okay. So uh, mainly may to uh, we make sure that your curriculums and your programs are up to date because the labor market is moving so fast. So you need you need that data to, to better improve those programs. Um, so when you do this, do you only when you trace your uh, students' employment, do you only send out one survey to graduates, or or do you trace beyond that and survey them again a few years later? Yeah, it depends. Um... For employability, we have a graduate survey and employer survey. For okay. the graduate survey, we send out uh, two survey, uh, mm -hmm. one year after graduation and four mm -hmm. years after graduation. So the, the, the objective is to compare over time to see what has happened to the graduate a few years later. Mm -hmm. And related to the outcomes, data shows that our graduates tend to improve their employment rates through the years. So in terms of finding, data show us that the, our graduates have some problems in the beginning of their career. I mean, they face some obstacles to access to the job market. So if we think that networking is important to employability, thus our graduates uh, do not have enough networks. Uh, and maybe this is one of the reasons could explain how low rates on employability uh, they they have some problem in, in the beginning, so they have no not network people. So it's important to mention that our students tend to present disadvantaged background. Uh, this is our profile of, of students, and maybe this is the one reason could explain low rates on employability immediately after graduate. So uh, oh. a student with disadvantaged background tend to present a. Uh, a low rate of networks. Okay, so I'll just summarize here. So, so you send out two surveys to your your graduates one year after graduation, and then again four years after graduation, and you send out an employer survey. Exactly. Okay. And we, that, we what, can what compare. Data, okay, that exactly. So, could you tell us what data exactly do you collect to give us an idea of how, what what information you're getting? Yeah. Um, we look at the trajectory of our student experience. Uh, we collect data about them before, during, and after they join us. Uh, this helps us to make good decisions. Make many of our students work uh, before joining Santo Tomas and during their studies. Uh, we also look at the school they study and their socioeconomic background. With this information, we can predict academic performance in some indicators such mm -hmm. as desertion probability or even class attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different categories arriving at our institution. We think, or we, we tend to think, that some are prepared for higher education and other need extra help, such as courses related to the basic skills in language and mathematics. If we don't provide this help, uh, our rotation rates will be low uh, due to the desertion phenomenon. For the graduate survey, we ask for the following information, uh, the skills that they nowadays are using for their jobs. And sometimes it is not the same as the skill we provide them during the education process in our institution. Uh, so in, in which case we need to amend. 
Uh, also, uh, we ask for how prepared they feel for the job based on the program. Uh, we ask for the job satisfaction. Uh, we ask for the salary range uh, and so on. Okay, so that that's a lot of data you're collecting, Herman. So your your and uh, it's not just once the student uh, has graduated. You said you're also collecting data while they're within the university, which is what I think Kim was was talking about and linking that. Um, so that's that's a lot of lot of data. Can you tell us? how you're using this uh, this data. How has all this data, like during, post, and then post again, and then the employers, uh, how has this affected your decision-making on the aspect of curricula? Yeah, it's a lot of data, effectively. Um, I, I would like to explain before that, that for the employer survey, uh, we ask, uh, including what the employer expects from our graduate, it is important the opinion of them, and mm -hmm. and what do they think of them in comparison to other graduates for other in higher education institutions? Uh, we ask to employer, uh, for example, skills needed, uh, and finally need to identify what are the skills need of different territories in the country. Some mm -hmm. skills might be important in one territory and and not another, as mm -hmm. the geography in Chile uh, is varied. Uh, for example, community needs differ according to the territory as the geography is different. Uh, we have desert by the north and the greenery by the south. Uh, related to how is the use of data? Uh, well, we charge the curriculum based on this data. We transform the curriculum to include uh, the new skills we are needed. Exam um, for example, the employability skills are not enough in the curriculum. Uh, skills that we need to focus on innovation, entrepreneurship, life of learning, problem solving, collab collaborative work, uh, especially after a uh, pandemic. So we add, that, add them to the curriculum. Sometimes it is just a small change that are needed, not a big change to the curriculum. And uh, sometimes we see uh, that we need a deeper change uh, is needed to amend the curriculum. It will depend on the change in the labor market finally. For example, after pandemic, uh, as I said before, some productive sector changed the required skills that they need from our graduate, and this change were very quickly. So we collect the information and then made change in our curriculum to refresh the content and the skills include. For other side, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the data say there's no need to change the curriculum and it's, and if it's not relevant, but there is a real need to offer extra courses to the students or that graduates need to refresh their skills post-graduation, which means offering post-graduation courses related principally with the uh, upskilling and reskilling. Uh, another example of data that we found, uh, and, and th this point maybe is, is, is relevant, uh, the self-analysis of our graduates showed us they think they're not prepared to the labor market. Uh, Again, maybe one of the causes of the pandemic. Um, but when we compare to the employers who buy, they say they're prepared. This illustrates a self-confidence issue among the, the students and graduates. This is not something we can change in a matter of months. It, it's a great challenge for us. It will require some thinking on how we can instill self-confidence in our students during their higher education experience. Hey. Okay, so uh, a number of takeaways. Sometimes uh, you, so once you've gathered all this information, you decide on what kind of changes you're going to make to your curricula. Sometimes it might be a big change. Sometimes it might be just adding on uh, a course post-graduation to help these students come back. It's something they need later on. And uh, a very interesting, I thought that was really, really interesting, this uh, and this. Uh, conclusion that you've come to or out, uh, from the from the analysis is that uh, self confidence is an issue, uh, and that you you're thinking about how to incorporate that into your, the curricula and, and programs. Thank you, thank you very much for sharing all that, Herman. 
Okay, so now we've seen why it's important and how the data is used. Let's look at best practices for designing uh, a survey, especially in, in a context where there's no national system enforcing this. Uh, Delida, what's your advice on setting up a graduate survey to trace uh, tra employment using best practices within a single institution? Right. Um, so we start with a policy statement and a strategy. Is this important to us as an institution? Um, why is it important to us and what policies we need to have in place in order to govern these studies? Certainly data governance is going to come to mind, data privacy and so on and so forth. Um, um, we then start with a protocol on how to approach the study and the protocol has some key components. The uh, I like to divide them into th big three buckets and then talk about the methodology. And these three big buckets are, are, are key definitions and criteria, the survey instrument and the survey calendar. The, the key definitions and criteria are important because they're going to establish our dateline and they're making our study process dependent, not people dependent. Mm -hmm. um, and what we mean by that is we need to agree as an institution on some um, key definitions of the indicators that we will be collecting. What is employment? Who is an employer? What brackets do our employers fall into? What's important to our labor market? How do we divide them? Is it private sector, public sector, multinational, international? So we have to reach a consensus as an institution. It has to be an informed one. So there's a set of these definitions, including what's a program of study? What is in my field? What does that mean, employment in my field? So once those are agreed upon, they become an integral part of the protocol. Um, the survey instrument, of course, is the next thing. There's lots of survey instruments out there. They tend to ask the exact same question. There's some uh, variation by country. I think there's about 40 common questions, there's, regardless of the country, um, that look into two indicators, right? One is the employment outcome, and the other one is, in, is uh, graduate satisfaction, the feedback to, um, to the institution on the skills they received. Um, when, I mean, I think the longest survey that I've seen is the one in China with 90 questions. Um, there's also, of course, the survey of logic. We don't want to go with 90 questions because that's it's going to lead to all kinds of issues. So there's best practices in designing surveys and embedding the survey logic as well. So do we want to track those that are in further uh, education but also have a job? Do we want to track people who have more than one job? It will, this will be labor market specific. It will depend on the country and the context in which you are operating. So these some of these indicators that are country specific, of course, will have their own questions in the survey. Um, we also want to establish a very important thing is the survey calendar. And mm -hmm. the survey calendar means we're establishing um, the reference week or the census week. When are we surveying our graduates? So we heard in the US it's six months after graduation. Um, some institutions will have prior to, right? It's, it's before they graduate, we have this exit survey and we ask them, have you already secured a job? Um, in other countries, it's a little bit more structured. We want to do it certainly six months after graduation, but also two years later. So there's a longitudinal study as well. In um, UK, they said it at 15 months. These these points in time, or the census week or reference week, have to make sense in the in the labor market. So, in Ghana, they established um, uh, their reference week at two years after graduation because there's a year of national service that students have to do. So they're giving them that year to do their national service, and then a year technically to find a job. So mm -hmm. again, the, the survey calendar. Whatever that reference or census week is when we're doing this, there's a lot of things that have to happen before and a lot of things that have to happen after. And that's why we need a separate survey calendar uh, in there to guide us every year because we want to make sure that the baseline is established that first time and that we're comparing apples to apples as we move uh, through the years looking for patterns. So right. that's basically the key elements 
of, of this um, protocol that we need in place. And then, of course, we talk about methodology. Right. So, yeah, um, it's in some way, there's the questions that you're going to ask. And then a very important point that you brought up, and that's timing or the calendar. And it looks like we've already answered one of the questions uh, that we've received, which is, yeah, what, what, when should these um, hmm. surveys be sent out? Another important aspect of the survey, and I can see there's a question about this one as well, is response rates. Uh -huh. uh, you, let's let's go into that a bit more deeper. How how can organisations increase the response rate of of their students? What strategies exist? What, what and what would you say is a good response rate? Hmm. Yeah, the six million dollar question. So, different countries that those that have mandatory, mind you, mandatory mm -hmm. collection of data. So, I will pick on Ontario, where I'm at, where it used to be in the 70s. So, this was the minimum response rate that the government would accept to make something an indicator. Right in the UK, they were in the 60s, and it goes down under longitudinal. Right, two years afterwards. Um, you want to aim high because we are surveying general population. We have programs that have low enrollment. So in order to get data relevant at the program level, we really need to aim high on the response rate. Um, how do we get there is, is a tough question because we don't get there easily. Uh, Kim talked about all kinds of ways to, to get that response rate if you don't get a survey response, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get that graduate satisfaction piece back. Um, it may be harder to get the, the salary brackets and depending on what secondary data sources you're using or if you can use the system data in any way. But there are things certainly that institutions can do. There are, they fall into two categories. One is the quality of um, contact. So the quality of contact is, what's the, when's the last time we asked our final year students, our graduating alumni, for different ways to reach them? What is our, our alumni management strategy? Do we have events that bring them back to campus that keep them engaged with the institution? So we start, and, and this is not, this can't be solved in one year. We have to make this a, an institutional strategy. Priming our students for this important trace study takes time and effort that has to start. We don't start after they leave. We start way before they leave. So we have a colleague who talks about a lot of different activities that they've done at their school with cards and incentives to leave that quality contact information, alternate contact information, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's that on the quality of contact. There is also the quality of communication. Who communicates to our students about the importance of the study? Do we provide any incentives to students? So, for example, we knew we did um, a pilot study in Ghana, a tracer study, and it was the first time. So we didn't expect to have a high response rate because the, the market is not primed for a high response rate. Right? Um, we discovered that we are asking students to complete an online survey that is going to require them using their own data. Right, their their own internet um, data. So we basically provided an incentive for that data use um, for their telephone company or their internet provider. There are lots of questions, and I think it's a, a webinar of a different kind, on the ethics of using incentives. And I think that that has uh, been solved in a way. I mean, you, there's lots of uh, research work, lots of good papers on the ethics of using incentives to, to incentivize the response rate and remove bias. Um, and you're welcome to Google it through. It's certainly out there. The Once we get that response rate, we worked really hard and we got that response rate. The quality of communication also means that we're reporting back to our graduates. So if we uh, heard them, we heard what they are saying about our, our uh, curriculum, their student experience, the services they received. Based on what we heard, we instituted a change. We made um, 
so we've made some improvements based on what we heard from our students, our alumni. We need to let them know. We need to let them know on our website. We need to let them know at alumni events so that we're establishing this culture that feedback is important. Right. Right. Yes, I think that's very important that because if you if you don't have that culture, nobody's going to respond to you. Thank you. Thank you, Danita, for, for all that. Uh, and just to compare maybe uh, or, or, or hear about like how, it, how it's working in Chile. Germán, could you tell us what your response rate is and, and what the challenges you've been facing? Yes. Um, so during pandemics, our response rates were around um, 65%. Uh, and that's mean for us a good rate. However, last year, uh, 2022, our response rate fell to 35. Okay. So now we're trying to understand the, the reason for that low rate. Uh, we know that nowadays our graduates receive a lot of advice, commercial campaigns from the private sectors and so on. So uh, this could affect maybe the response rate of uh, our student and our graduates and even uh, maybe our uh, employers. Mm -hmm. uh, related to the strategies um, that used to reach their response rate, um, in order to reach that we take a lot of action, uh, we offer rewards, uh, including uh, computers or some travel tour to the other country in Latin America. Uh, for other side, we contact them by phone to ask them to respond to the survive. Uh, we need to develop, in general, uh, in our grade, a sense of belong, uh, uh, like alumni, and, and, and this is a real challenge for us. Um, and, and also, we prepare our students and let them know how important it is to get this information. Uh, not only for 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 them uh, and also for the prospective student that uh, going to to enter this uh, our university okay so yeah it's it's that uh, what delila was just talking about is creating that culture preparing them giving them this information um, one last uh, question and then we'll move to the audience's questions um, Kim, could you, uh, I'd like to hear from you on technology, the use of technology, and you brought this up earlier. Any advice you give the audience, especially given the high potential cost of technology to conduct analysis and uh, with this kind of data? Uh, and and uh, any challenges you see involved in using very basic technology like SurveyMonkey? So I think that for the survey itself, the technology can be pretty simple. I think the biggest thing you need to look for is that it can do that display logic or skip logic or um, branching. They use different words, but you know, so that you can ask follow-up questions without having an extremely long survey for everyone. So I think that's the most important piece to it. Most survey technology has that now. Some mm -hmm. form technology doesn't. So for example, in the US, many of us have access to Google Forms and we love them for many reasons, but their display logic is very clunky. So I wouldn't suggest doing this kind of survey on that tool, but some basic ones like Alchemer, Survey Gizmo, Survey Monkey do have that, that logic and can work quite well. Um, the other thing I, to keep in mind that's become invaluable to the services we provide here with our campuses is a um, survey tool that can give you a QR code that has a link embedded in it. Our campuses, in order to drive up that response rate, are using those QR codes. They're having them mailed. They're putting them in mailers to people. They're putting them on their social media. They're using them in commencement activities um, so that students can quickly take a picture of that QR code and it takes them right to the survey. So they're trying to capture them where they're at in a very convenient way. And those QR codes have become really important to that strategy. And then on the analysis end, I would say that I've been doing this work for a very long time and 95% of what I do is in Excel. Um, so whatever sort of, you know, basic um, spreadsheet tool you have, you can do a lot of this, this kind of work in there to get the basic information you want. Now, when you start looking at things like what experiences lead to better outcomes and you want us to do some more in-depth analysis, that's when you really have to start thinking about more sophisticated statistical tools. But in mm -hmm. my experience, that's maybe 
two, three, fourth iterations down the road. Um, this takes a long time to build up the basics first. And then when you want to start looking at that deeper, then you know what questions you want to ask and what technology can get you there. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kim. I wanted to touch upon that quickly because I know it's a topic and now I need to get to the questions because we have quite a few. Uh, so the audience is, is very interested in what you all have to say. Now we've answered a couple of them uh, on uh, setting up surveys and timing. Uh, and then there are a couple of more deeper questions there and I'm going to direct those at Delita because you 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 spoke about that um, and that is okay related to the tracer study calendar what's the ideal time to conduct uh, a survey from your experiences in, 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 in Ghana and then how many in your opinion how many questions are, are ideal to increase hmm. the response rate hmm. right um the, the short answer is I don't know. This will depend on uh, on your context, on your country. If you have a national service, then you don't want to serve until they're done with the national service, right? If um, the uh, it, it, look, we've 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 done this in countries where labor market is relatively. I can't say healthy, but healthier than in other markets. So students take less time to get a job. If you are operating in a challenging labor market, do you want to survey them six months after graduation? Mm -hmm. it, it won't be that helpful to you. So again, this is going to be contextual. We picked 24 months in Ghana for a reason. And, and we spent time thinking when to, why 24? Yes, indeed, it's a national service. It's also because we were looking at a particular um, sector in Ghana, which was technical universities that are new. So the labor market doesn't know them very well, doesn't understand the BTEC degree. So there was lots of reasons why we picked what we picked. Um, this is going to be specific to your context, to your country uh, on the timing. Whatever you do, you will establish your baseline for that timeline, for that reference week. You can always add your longitudinal one as well. It gets harder on the response rate and the quality of context. As for the length of survey, a real quick answer. Um, you don't want survey fatigue. You don't want technology that is going to be cumbersome to be used. You also need to think through which questions are you allowing students to skip? You can live without them. Right. Um, and if you are anytime you say I would allow students to skip this, well, maybe you don't need that question. So asking yourself, which, which questions do you really need to ask is the key as you're going through making this survey instrument. When we did it in, uh, in Ghana and looked at the logic, there were 48 unique questions, but nobody got a 48 questions in their survey because there was a skip logic involved. So the maximum number of questions people got was 28. And that's folks who were, you know, doing further ed and uh, had a job full time. So it's a very specific demographic that got the longest survey because we we're asking lots of um, questions like why. So right. Oh, Thanks. That thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Delila. And we have another question here from somebody in the Palestinian Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. I'm going to direct this at, at you, Kim. Uh, I said he's looking for ideas on how to collect uh, graduate data. But So I, I hope you've got quite a few ideas here, Mohammed. Um, Kim, could you maybe give um, uh, a tip or some advice to somebody that's on the beginning of their journey. Uh, uh, and I understand this is what Muhammad is, is asking. So I would say the first thing is to think about um, what information you want, why you need it, and then how do you explain that to the people you need the information from? So the, the hardest thing is getting people to respond to a survey. And I have found that the easiest way to do it is to tell them why. Um, if you can tell them why, how it relates to their experience or how it relates to how they can help the institution or help the organization, people are more likely to click on that link and give you the information. Um, as long as you also then have a really well-designed survey instrument that doesn't take time. 
Um, so my, my first suggestion is pick a group first, start with that. It's okay to pilot and say, we're going to focus on these particular academic programs or this particular graduate year um, and do some learning from there. Um, but it's really important, I think, um, to get the why in there so people know why they should give you the information to begin with um, and then go from there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And then we have a, a question from Lisa. Uh, and I'm going to direct this at you, Herman, because um, uh, you can respond based on the units you have. How many people are responsible at your institution for the survey and data analysis? And in which unit is that located? Yes. <clears throat> um, the Development and Quality Assurance Department is responsible for sending out the surveys and getting the response. Um, sometimes these departments are supported by the student experience and graduate department in a collaborative work. Um, between four and six people participate in this process, but uh, but are not only dedicated to survive. Uh, they have another task as well. Um, and also sometimes they ask external bodies or, or private agencies to administer the survive, and they send the data from the internal analysis. In that case, uh, the cost for us is around $38,000 uh, in, in general. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 